bunch of people that um, said they're coming and um, and may not have been able to make it. Um, that's why we've got the handicam recording happening today for those that haven't. We're very um, we're really researching online versus in person, but this is our, our first return to in-person Captain's Table. We've had 80 people in this room before, would you believe? And uh, Captain's Table's been going, well, it actually really started back in 1998, but it's been going 10 years uh, in this format, and uh, which is really short, sharp, really good speakers on, on issues that are important to the recruitment industry. And um, we're really grateful. My name's Tony Hall, for those of you that uh, we, I haven't met, but I think I've met most of you. And uh, I've been uh, in the industry since 1998, former EY consultant, and now specialise in helping to grow and improve recruitment companies. I sit on the board of recruitment companies around Australia. And I'm really passionate about uh, imparting knowledge and sharing knowledge. And uh, with the thanks of our sponsors, uh, we've got Job Adder, we've got William Buck, we've got Ayers Group, uh, we've got DigiPro down in Melbourne, and um, we've also got A Positive. We're really grateful for their support to bring Captain's Table and uh, to you all. And uh, thank you to our regulars, of which a few of you are in the room, and um, appreciate you always being here and supporting us. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Cameron Martin and Andrew, his um, his colleague from William Buck, who are going to speak with you today and uh, impart some of their wisdom. They do a lot of work for recruitment companies, so they know our industry well. And um, I hear such good feedback from the work they do in our industry. So, Cameron, thank you very much for presenting today. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. <coughs> it's great to be here. It's great to um, be back in person and doing some of these things um, together. So, happy to sort of have some interaction, happy to have questions as we go, happy if people want to talk about war stories and things like that from their experiences um, as we're going. Um, happy to, to, to do that if we can. So, before we get into the presentation today, um, just a little bit um, about uh, William Buck, if you haven't um, had anything to do with us before. So we're a leading uh, mid-tier accounting firm with offices around Australia. So we're about number 10 on the list. Our focus is um, S, sort of the mid-market, so small to medium businesses, private businesses predominantly. Some of those range from one to two people businesses up to businesses that have got two or three hundred staff. So it's quite broad, but it is still that small um, private business model international type stuff um, that we're doing um, and and some of those businesses we offer all sorts of different um, you know, services to them so the normal accounting and tax type stuff um, but then we're focusing a lot more these days on um, some of the business advisory things that we can help businesses um, achieve their growth ambitions uh, minimize taxes and just help them on that journey of business and, and help simplify some of the things that we're doing um, in terms of the, the team, so as Tony mentioned, my name's Cameron Martin, my colleague Andrew Toole, who, who also works with me on a lot of recruitment um, businesses, but we've also got some expertise um, and some other advisors around Australia. So this, this presentation we're doing in Brisbane and Melbourne, and obviously today in Sydney. So today's topic um, is about maximising the value of your recruitment business. So for some people this might be, I'm considering selling my business in the next few years, this might be, I'm not considering selling, but I think it's still a really important topic to consider and look at. Um, they say that for a lot of average Australians, their home is their number one asset. I'd say for any business owner, hopefully, their number one asset if they're in the recruitment industry is their recruitment business. Um, so working out how you can maximise that value, I think is going to really potentially be life-changing um, for you and your family if you can get that right. So. Um, all I'd say is if you're thinking of selling, you might have a, cer a certain lens on today's topic and, and the information you're going to hear. If you're not going to sell, I think it's still really important to listen. It's a bit like if you've got property and you want to rent it out and you're sitting there going, well, should I paint it? Should I fix the kitchen up? Obviously, any of those things that you do to a house is going to hopefully, hopefully help the rental income. If you do something similar with your business and you improve it and you're constantly improving it, hopefully the dividends and the profits that you're generating on a year to year basis going to also improve and that will then give you hopefully a higher value one day than you said. So today what we're going to cover, uh, first of all I'll give you just a bit of an, an insight into what we're seeing in terms of economic and industry insights um, across the clients that we're working with both, both in the recruitment industry and in the, the wider business community. Um, I'll take you through, I think it's good to try and understand if you're looking at trying to maximise your value how a recruitment business is normally valued. So I'll take you through a bit of a, 
a, a, a some bullet points on how um, recruitment businesses are valued, businesses might be valued. Then the main area that I want to focus on a bit of time is some of the tips and ideas that, that I bring to how you can increase that value and things you can do better. Um, we'll then talk about what the process of the business are might look like one day. Again, you may not be looking at doing that now, but there's definitely things you can be doing um, even three to five years ahead of that time to, to make things um, work smoother. We'll then talk a little bit about who a potential buyer might look like. Um, we'll then talk about some tax structures and some of the things that you might want to do to your business to set it up so that it's in a position um, to sell one day. And then if we've got time, we'll then look at some end of year financial sort of tax planning things that you might want to consider uh, thinking about in your business before you know, we get to 30 June, which is only now another five, five and a half weeks away. So I don't know about everyone else, but it seems to have crept up. It feels like just the other day we were, um, we were at Christmas in January and, and still battling those sort of COVID cases and things and we're already at the end of the financial year. So firstly, just in terms of economic updates and things like that, um, what we've seen in our client base particularly is the government support has been really targeted over the last couple of years for, for businesses that were suffering in COVID. And a lot of that, that money did go into um, lots of different businesses, including the recruitment industry. Um, our feeling is that that money was well directed and it did help you know, keep the economy going. If you think back to you know, nearly a bit over two years ago, potentially there was going to be all sorts of job losses and things like that. So I think um, the, the government stimulus money did help. Uh, and, and I think from what we've seen, that's helped the recruitment businesses in particular go on and continue to make really strong profits and continue to, to, to see you know, strong demand for their businesses. In terms of overall economic activity, I mean, with the, with the recent election and, and things like interest rates and whatever, a lot of us would be aware of some of the, the discussion that's being had around what's happening with the world economy. If you've looked at um, the stock market in the last month or so and you hadn't looked at it for a few months before, you might have got a bit of a rude shock to see what's going on there. I think the, the world, the world um, stock markets are potentially factoring in, there's a reasonable chance, I'm saying 50-50, some people are quoting other numbers of potentially a worldwide recession just off the back of how fast the inflation is going and the fact that interest rates are going to be pushed and what that does to demand and supply. Um, but I think, you know, when I hear people talk about interest rates going up, you know, you've got to remember where interest rates were and where they've come to and so even a couple of, you know, 25 basis point in increases in interest rates I can't see them having a massive impact on the economy um, and, and having a massive impact on demand anytime soon. So on that basis, um, you know, we're still seeing strong. And I think the other thing which is very key for the recruitment industry in particular is around the um, unemployment. So at the moment, unemployment, you know, I think is about 3%. Um, Albo didn't know that number. He thought it was 5% at one point there, but it is around that 3% mark. It's, it's, Know, record lows, we've not seen it anywhere near that forever. Even if there is a bit of a downturn in the economy and that unemployment rate does tick up a little bit, I still think there's going to be massive de demand for recruitment services. And I think that's good for the industry that, that you guys are in, that you're going to continue to see that demand. Um, and, and what we're seeing in our client base is that, that businesses that are focused, particularly in, the, in industries that are in demand coming out of this, um, this COVID period, are seeing record period so they're, they're seeing record profits they're seeing record turnover and some of those businesses are seeing quarter on quarter you know they're saying last quarter was a record and the next quarter they're having a record on top of that so the demand for those services are definitely there um, we're seeing you know it, it's a bit like a, a real estate market that's, that's hot to try if you get all the listings then you're going to get sales you know, the good listings just generate sales and I think at the moment it's the same thing where we're we're in short supply of candidates. If you can get some good candidate sourcing people in your business, um, you're really going to do well and you're really going to see those results um, come out to play. Um, I, I think now is really just a time to capitalise on that. So, you know, if you're making good money in your business, what can you do to capitalise on that? And that's sort of my last point there. And, 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 and think about what can you do, you know, to do rather than just sit there and be busy every day and just keep going through the motions, what can you do to capitalise on this great demand? How can you, you know, sometimes people talk about, you know, they've got a customer that's annoying and, and that they're not necessarily profitable and they're not doing it now. Potentially, is the time to be picky and to look at your business and say, well, where is where are my customers? Am I happy with them? Am I 
happy in the place that I'm playing in? Am I happy with you know all the sorts of things that you're doing? Um, and potentially now's a good time to think of doing that. Before we get on to talking about how you may maybe go about increasing the value of your recruitment business, I think it's useful to start by looking at well how how do you actually go and value it? So if we were given an assignment, for example, to go and value a business, where would we start as a professional and, and have you got someone to value your business what, what they'd be looking at? So there's a number of different methods that people use. Um, some of them are things like book value, you might have heard, discounted cash flows, um, you know, a multiple of revenue, you know, an industry benchmark, things like that. For a lot of private businesses, um, the, the main consideration there is always um, an, an earnings multiplier. So you might have heard this term, you know, a multiple of profits or you know, EBITDA times you know, X amount of number, and that's, that's where people are getting their values from using that particular method. Um, that's the most common method and that's the, the method I'll, I'll quickly give you a bit of a guide in because that's where we're seeing you know, the majority of businesses are being sold. So effectively what people are looking at is saying if I'm going to buy your business, I get your business but I'm getting the future profits that that business is generating. So what are those future profits looking like? And then let's have a look at maybe what the profits were like for the last few years to give us a guide as to what we think those profits are going to be like um, you know, going forward. So first of all, you need to look at, well, what does that EBITDA number look like? So EBITDA stands for Earnings Before Interest Tax Depreciation and Amortisation. So you've got to get that number and you've got to normalise that number and try and understand what it means. Um, so if you had a one-off transaction where you maybe had a new fit out in your office or you, know, you had some one-off expense or some one-off income, you'd, you'd like ideally normalise and adjust for that. And you normally go back and look at maybe our starting point might be the average of the last three years' profits um, and see maybe you get an average of the last three years because if you take one year, that might not be a really good indication of how the business is performing. Um, and once you've got that number, the multiple that you times it by is effectively what you get your value. So if, let's say the multiple that was chosen was at three times, well then if, if the business was making a million dollars a year, then the value would be three million dollars. Um, so in terms of what drives those multipliers, so it comes down to, and I use the expression sometimes, that your starting point, if it's a very much an owner-managed, dominated business, two to three times is what you're expecting. So if you're making a million dollars, two to three million dollars in sort of value for that business is probably what you're expecting. If you've got a business that I call is a bit more managed, you know, it's, it's professionally managed, you've got some people in there, you've got some scale to it, you've got some you know, different people and, and that sort of thing, you're probably then looking more towards the uh, four to five times multiple. So if you've got a brand, you've got the team, you've got maybe an industry specialisation, that type of thing, then you're looking higher. Um, and, and potentially, in terms of what industry expectations are, that's sort of what people are expecting for private businesses. Um, but we are seeing probably, there's not a lot of buyers in the Australian, local Australian market for recruitment businesses at the moment. Um, but we are starting to see some activity from overseas, either Europe or American-based businesses looking to buy into Australia. And if, you, if you're in that position and those companies want to strategically buy your business, potentially you can get higher than four to five times, even if you've got a business that's got you know, multiple offices around Australia, potentially you've got a bit of scale, you could potentially see that number. Um, you know, instead of being three or four, it could potentially be that five, six, and even seven times um, up there, so obviously that, that's a great result. Can I ask, what's the distinction between firm, temp and, and hybrid? So that definitely does affect the, the valuation, so people will pay a lot more for a temp um, book and a contracting book. So like you guys would see the same, if you've got a contracting book, you know that if you've signed someone up on a six or twelve month contract, that income is coming, it's going to be there month after month. If a purchase is coming in and you're 100% perm, they're going to be concerned, well, how much of that is around the current owners? How do I know that that's going to continue? Or at least when you've locked in those contractors, 100% you're going to expect, um, you either expect a higher multiple potentially for that business. Um, so if you were still an owner managed business, that two to three times might be more like the three to four times rather than the two times. Cameron, just locally then, you said the appetite's not very strong. Why is that when the economy's doing so well? Partly it just goes in cycles, so quite often um, what you tend to find in Australia and a lot of different industries, if other businesses are buying, the competitors go, well, if they're getting bigger, I need to buy businesses too, and it's just a, 
just a flow-on effect, I suppose, like that, um, really. The, the issue some Australian recruitment businesses have at the moment is they're making record profits, and they're saying, well, I've made you know, a couple of million dollars profit last year, I'd expect to get paid based on that. And the purchaser's coming in and saying, well, yeah, but because of COVID, the numbers have gone up quickly, I'll only pay you based on what you were doing three years ago, maybe, that was pre-COVID. And then, so the owners are saying, well, I'm not going to sell out for that because I was only making half a million dollars in those days. So there's a bit of a, that price um, barrier, but there just doesn't seem to be, um, you know, there's big multinationals, but some of those big, big multinationals just can't acquire um, a privately run business with maybe 10 or 15 staff that they'd be interested in if you had 50 to 100 people. Um, but if you're any less than that 50 person size business, those bigger Australian based listed companies don't tend to be interested. Uh, but I think if some of these international buyers get a bit of traction, then there'll be some com competition and potentially we will see some consolidation in the market. Um, and I'll go through in a minute about what things that they're going to be looking for, um, but potentially it's, you know, if you want to be more attractive to one of those international buyers, you've got to have a brand, you've got to have a bit of PR about you so people actually know that you exist in the industry, not just focusing on you know, getting candidates and clients, for example. So hopefully that answers that question. Quickly there, in terms of um, enterprise versus equity value, what I'm meaning there is that enterprise value is what you get for the actual business itself. But quite often we get asked the question where well, we've got working capital in the business, we've got maybe excess cash that we haven't taken out of dividends for the last year or two. That is what I'd refer to as the equity value. So you potentially get a bit more if someone comes in and buys your business if you've got that extra cash there. So this is sort of my favourite area, and this is where I like working with business clients on for all sorts of parts of their business, but particularly if we're talking about business value and around, you know, how can I improve the business value that I've got? Um, what can I be doing to, to increase it? So there's lots of things you can do. I mean, the first one I think there um, is probably quite obvious, but planning. So if you want to potentially increase the value of your business, starting from scratch and not doing any planning, it's going to be very difficult. And it's not something that's necessarily going to happen um, overnight. And potentially you're looking at doing something and you're you know, maybe expanding into a new market and then you get a resignation of the key person. So you can't just sit there saying, I'm going to grow, I'm going to do something over the next six to 12 months because that's unlikely, or it could happen, but chances are something will go wrong and you'll need to have time to be able to rebuild. Um, the second point there, I'll talk about specialisation and I think that's some of the bigger values that we've seen businesses sell for is when they've got a specialisation, particularly in an industry that is in demand, um, that where people see a future and potentially where requirers are looking at. Um, so, you know, things like blue collar may not be as attractive as, you know, someone doing something in, you know, software engineers that are in demand, for example, at the moment. Um, so people are going to uh, focus, if you're looking at increasing your value, a potential purchase is going to want to pay more for your business if you've got a specialisation that's uh, well known. And, and I think the brand is really important. So a lot of people underestimate the fact that you know, coming to events like this, networking amongst your peers, going to conferences internationally, it's probably not going to win you any more candidates, it may not win you any more staff, and it probably won't win you any more customers, but it definitely increases your chances of bumping into and talking to someone that you may want to do business in the future. You might want to acquire them, they might want to acquire you in the future, but having that um, brand, I think, helps start create those conversations. Um, and some of that could be just marketing, and some of it could be Know, setting up new offices or, or doing something in your market that makes people aware of what you're doing. The third one there, which I think is really key, and it's probably in some cases the most important one, is about that management team and having that structure there. So a lot of uh, potential business purchases will come, or potential purchases come along and say, I'm just concerned that the owner is very dominating in the business. You can see that they're, you know, their hands are over everything, even if they're not billing on their own and they're doing firm. They've got all the relationships with the key customers, you know, which is fair enough in some cases because um, you know, an owner is going to obviously operate their business to a higher level than maybe someone that's, that's not an owner. But I think you've got to make sure that you've got, it's not just around one person, that potentially you've got that sort of general manager type style person in there maybe. You've got a team of people. Ideally, you've got some sort of executive committee. So there's you know, two, three, four or six people that are that key management group, so that if something happens to one of them, someone else can pick up on what's going on. 
Um, and then, you know, just things like having a good quality team. So the purchasers coming in and saying, wow, I'm really impressed by the fact that you've got, you know, two or, the, two or three really strong people so that the owner wasn't there, these people can step into that role. Or potentially even, we've seen successfully some owners transition to more of that chairman style role and bring the CEO in. I mean, that's, that's going to even increase the value dramatically because a purchaser potentially doesn't need to worry about transitioning an owner out of the business so much. They've potentially already got a CEO in there and they're becoming more of an investor. Um, the customer mix one, I mean, it's always a, a double-edged sword. You, you, you always like to have a big customer because it's good income. There's always revenue coming in from them, whether it's perm or whether it's contracting. It can be a detractor, though, if it's too big. Um, so a lot of purchases, if, if you had more than 30% of the turnover or 30% of the profit coming from one customer, they're potentially going to discount that. So uh, we've seen some purchases say basically 30% is their limit. Anything above that number, they're just going to wipe it out. So if you've got a million dollars profit and 700,000 of it's coming from one customer, they'll potentially say, no, we're not paying you for that seven, we'll only pay you for the 300. Now obviously it's up to you to negotiate that that doesn't happen potentially, um, but it's in your interest if you can to try and spread that customer mix. And the main reason a purchase is looking at it, which to be honest, any business owner should be thinking of it themselves anyway, is what happens if something happens to that customer? If they get, that customer gets bought out and they decide to then buy from a competitor, what does that do in your business? So it, it's all good and well. We've worked with lots of business owners in, in the recruitment industry, but other industries too, about fixing that. And sometimes you can fix it, but other times you can't because you don't want to turn them away. Ideally, what you want to do is grow all your other customers around it which is obviously the ideal, but that doesn't always necessarily happen overnight. Um, as we mentioned before, the, the temp contracting versus you know, perm split is really, really important. Um, you know, ideally, you know, a good mix of that, and there's no sort of one rule of thumb, but if you can get 50, 60% of your income coming from contract perm, you're going to be doing a lot better than it being only 10 or 20%. So if, you, if your business is very predominantly perm, now, going back to my first slide about opportunity to do something now might be the time to think about um, can you build that contracting temple do you have the right people internally because if you do it's probably going to increase the value of your business if you've got gross margin of you know five hundred thousand dollars a year coming from a contracting book compared to a perm book you're probably going to get a, you know a heap more value in your business um, from that basis I think I think size it's very important. I think that the bigger the business, the higher, it probably that may not necessarily change your profit, but it probably changes your multiple. So the bigger the business is, if you've got 50 people, for example, the risk of one person leaving or one customer leaving, or they're, they're much lower than if you've got five people. One person leaves, potentially 20% of your revenue is gonna walk out the door. If you've got 50 people, that's not likely to happen. So a purchase is like a bit of scale. You don't need to be hundreds of people, but you need to have a decent number and ideally a bit of a presence, so maybe a couple of offices. So we've seen a lot of businesses start with, you know, their, what you would call just the serviced office approach, and I think that's a really good way of starting to move into, say, a Sydney or Melbourne market when you're not in there. But if you can get a few people in, in, in an office, I think it does help later on down the track. Uh, particularly if it's an overseas co uh, buyer coming in, and they want that scale already there. It just means that they can grow that and add to it rather than starting it from scratch. I think there, the profit trend is really important. So you want to have a profit number that's growing, not a, not a plateauing business. So again, if you're going to get a higher multiple, people are looking at a business that's growing. It's, it, the trajectory is upwards, not sideways or not downwards. That tends to tell you that the owner or the management team are less interested in the business and that they've maybe taken their eye off the ball, they've lost their passion and maybe that's the reason they're selling. So having a, a trajectory going up is very important. Um, and, and obviously reviewing your expenses to me is an obvious one. If you want to increase the value of your business, as we spoke about previously, if you can increase that EBITDA number, that's going to increase the value of your business. So by increasing your profit number by either, you know, increasing it through more revenue, but potentially looking at some of your expenses and, you know, are you paying market remuneration for things? Is there some things, some expenses that you can maybe eliminate? Any questions on, on that in terms of how to improve your value? I think there's some really good, hopefully you've picked up some good tips. Just, just on the size number, did you, do you often get a particular, is it like a feel of a 
signs that they generally do like come to you and say, hey, look, we really do want this. You, you mentioned obviously about the 30% thing that, that a few clients come to you with. Does size come into it as well? You, I know you said bigger the better, but is there a particular like sweet spot that you, you do find? I think for, that sort of 30 to 50 people is a good size because it's not too massive that they have to pay a lot of money for it and so there's a big risk there. Anything less than 30 people, a lot of bigger international buyers don't like because it's just too small. There's potentially too many private things going on. There's too many risks. There's just not enough people to spread that risk around. So, yeah, if I had to say that 30 to 50 is probably a good number. If you had an office in Sydney and Melbourne, I think that looks good. If you've got another office maybe in, depending on the Do you think market. the office thing is important anymore? Is that I still think it is because it does give you that presence. It does give you the feeling that I've got um, people on the ground in those particular markets. Um, but yeah, happy to be challenged on that, that potentially now going forward, does it really matter? I mean, I think a lot of recruiters aren't seeing candidates face to face anymore. Is, there, is anyone else finding that, that they're pretty much, even if they are going into the office, they're not really necessarily seeing a lot of people face to face still. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a real trend for during COVID for people recruiting online and, and they can recruit anywhere in the country now and people are going, hmm, I'm not sure, I want the expense of a interstate office now when I can effectively handle recruitment from uh, the comfort of my own home office. Yeah, yeah. and there's another argument to there in, in terms of to, to consider there also though that potentially you want to be able to attract people that are living in different markets. So we're even seeing in our business that we've had some people that we, one lady is in the marketing area and she wanted to move to Queensland, so we accommodated it on the basis that we've got a Queensland office. She's still marketing into the New South Wales market, but we don't actually need her sitting at a desk in our office when we can still work with my people. So it can definitely work, but I think if I'm an overseas person coming in and I don't know the business that well, seeing the different offices and seeing that the business has got a bit of scale, I think makes me feel a lot more comfortable and a lot more solid than the business is going to be successful and it's more likely to, to continue on. Cameron, just on your previous point about not wanting to meet people face to face, um, I think the biggest challenge in our business is not getting jobs for sure, not necessarily finding candidates, but having people renege or get multiple offers and I think there's something to be said for meeting a candidate face to face, so particularly over a coffee or something, developing that rapport that you're less likely to candidate to deal with counter offers or renex or anything like that if you've got that personal touch. Yeah, they feel they feel more guilty where if they don't know you and you're just someone on the end of a, a text message, it's easier to potentially then say to someone else, I'll take that offer, but where if they've gone and looked you in the face, if you've, you've shook hands with them or whatever, they're less likely to back out. Mm -hmm. And that was the old way, you know, when I first started my career 20 years ago, if you got offered a job, then you were over the moon that you had the job and you, yeah. as soon as you got that job, you did not look at anything else. If you were interviewing somewhere else, you rang them and said, sorry, I've taken another job. These days, people don't tend to do that. They're looking at all those options. So anything yeah. you can do to, to tighten that down would definitely work well, I think I agree. I'd like to take one of their children hostage. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you find that you get them to come? Is it worthwhile getting them to come into your office or? meeting them at a coffee shop or going to somewhere so we, near uh, there? They come to the office and yep. then we walk together to a coffee shop. Okay. Um, and that just gives me a little bit of time to create a bit of rapport and I think that works nicely. Cool. Okay. Good tip. This is just a quick slide in relation to you know factors that can potentially erode valuation and looking at preparation. So you can see there the second one, which we'll go and look at it, we'll talk about it in a minute, but poor, poor quality information. So financial and business information that's, that, that's bad. Um, you know, the preparation is bad, um, potentially loss of um, focus by the business owners, that's very evident when someone starts looking at your business. If I'm buying a business, the, the past is useful as an accountant, I like to look at the past because that gives me an idea of the future, but I want to be talking to an entrepreneur that's telling me about, I've got an idea for this, I've started this new segment in this particular industry, this is really, I found that I'm getting a lot of traction in this particular area. I'm finding that I'm meeting candidates in person and that's what I'm doing. If you can talk about all that sort of stuff, that's going to give someone the impression that the business is going forward rather than potentially someone that's sort of plateaued. And even if you're not selling a business, all of that stuff is, is going to help increase the value of your business. And if we keep going back to what I said before, increase the value of your business, chances are you're going to increase the value of your dividends with profits, which means that it's a win-win either way. 
um, and, and then down the bottom there we're talking about potentially you know, um, the due diligence process and problems that can go there and then potentially what your you know, realised value might be. So if you look on the left hand side there we're saying that's what someone selling expects the value to be and potentially the, the, the realistic realised value can potentially be that small yellow box down the right hand side there if you don't get some of those things right you know, across your journey. Um, and, and they always say that and, and, and it's the same with a lot of things. If you are desperate to sell your business, chances are it's probably not in the right position to sell at that particular time. So it could be for health or it could be for other reasons, where if you're planning and doing all these things to maximise your value over the time, then when it does come time to sell or someone approaches you ideally off the cuff, and um, you, you're going to hopefully get a, a bit of value. Next part I'll talk about <clears throat> sort of if you do ever get to the point of wanting to sell your business and that sort of due diligence or that um, that process what it might look like because I think if you can think ahead even potentially three to five years about some of these things you're going to be in a much better position if you get to the point where someone approaches you and says I want to buy your business and you start thinking about these things then I can tell you you're either going to um, end up not happy with the result because it won't go ahead or the value you're going to get for your business potentially will be um, diminished. So first thing I'd start by looking is having a good look at your financials. Um, if you haven't done it for a while, sit down with your internal accountant or your external accountant and just ask lots of questions around you know, the balance sheet, balances, um, you know, expense items, all sorts of things like that and have a look and see whether you can potentially clean some things up. And some of those might be around personal expenses. So sometimes business owners, potentially, if they've started really small, treat their business as just an extension of their own private you know, um, bucket, if you like. And there's lots of personal assets, expenses and, and personal assets going through there. Sometimes there's private cars. There's potentially you know, office furniture that might really belong to the owners and not the business. Um, think about the fact that if you've got to explain all of those things, how complicated it might be to someone. And if you've got an opportunity in the, in the, the start to start cleaning up some of that stuff, it's going to be a lot easier to explain to people. You're not going to have to be going, well, the profit here says this and that, but it's actually an extra 20000 a year more because we've got all these other things. People are always a bit sort of, um, you know, they're not sure, are, are you telling the, the truth or are you trying to just upsell the business? Um, I think the systems and processes and sort of, have a look at your financial statements and say, if I was looking at this for the first time, does it present the business well? So if, if contracting and temp is a big part of your business and you're making good margins on it, make sure that your financials present that way. Make sure that if you're getting a margin on your contracting temp that's 20 plus percent, make sure your financials say that. Make sure that that's very obvious. Don't You, know, you might know it yourself, but make sure that that's there and it's quite <coughs> obvious to someone opening it for the first time. Because if a potential purchaser looks at your financial, sorry, wants to look at your business, one of the first things I want to look at is your financials and being able to present them in a, in a, in a good way, I think, is, is a really good thing. Um, benchmarking is, is, I think, an awesome way of learning from others and, and how you can improve your business. Um, and I'm sure, I know Tony's mentioned in the past, he's got lots of information on other recruitment businesses, so do we. If you're interested in understanding a bit about benchmarking, reach out to Tony, reach out to Andrew and myself. We're happy to share some of the information we've got. Um, and I think that's something that you should be doing in your monthly accounts or your quarterly figures, thinking about, you know, how does my number compare to the industry and what do I want it to be? So sometimes people will look at, well, my you know, wages, my internal wages as a percentage of my turnover is X percent. What they don't look and say is, well, at the moment it's 55, 60%. I'd like it to be you know, closer to 45%. But what they don't do on a monthly basis is sort of keep themselves honest and work out, well, what am I going to do to get it down and then monitor it? They look at benchmarking maybe once and then they don't look at it again for another few years and then they come back to it. So I think thinking about what you need to look at and some of those key numbers, so I think some of them are around gross margins that you're making from uh, contracting and temp. I think that's really important. And then some of the other benchmarking things that we tell our recruitment clients to look at is returns on people. So if you've got 30 recruiters out there looking at PERM, for example, what are they returning you on a monthly basis? What, what, what's their billings? What, what's that multiple look like? If you're paying someone 100,000 a year plus commission, are they bringing in 200,000 of revenue or are they bringing in 350? And what do you want that number to look like? And what are you doing to, to, to monitor that on an ongoing basis? 
your financial reporting pack, that sort of fourth point there, I think is really important to make sure that you've got a really good financial report pack that you look at on a monthly basis or quarterly basis. Um, it helps you run the business better. It helps if you're bringing in an advisor or someone like that to be able to quickly analyse the business and understand where things are going. But also, more importantly, if you ever did sell your business, it's something you'd probably give to a purchaser. And if you've got a report pack that's you know, one page long and, and the P&L doesn't really you know, add up or the balance sheet doesn't balance and there's, there's obvious errors in there, that's not going to give someone as much confidence than maybe a 10 page report that's got some graphs in there, got some really good information and someone's first impression of that is, wow, these guys really know what they're doing. They're monitoring some of these key KPIs that I would have thought they would have done um, and, and that makes me confident that they know what they're doing. Um, I won't go into any detail around this IM or information memorandum, but that's a document you might have heard of before, which is about how you go about presenting the business. So there would be some financial information in there, but a lot of it would be around how do we present, how does this business look like, you know, what's the size, what market do we play in, what's our sort of key, what's our secret source for why we do well, um, you know, why, why would you want to consider looking at this business, that's what that document to do. Um, in terms of the due diligence process, I think where I've seen a lot of business sales fall over is that the owners aren't ready for that. They, they, they're ready, they've got their financials done maybe and they've got a couple of other reports, but they're not aware of what things people will want to look at. They're not aware that people will want, for example, you know, a list of customers and what turnover you've done with them, a list of um, you know, which consultants work on those customers. Um, a list of you know, gross margin by customer for perm, maybe, for, for temp, sorry. Um, you know, they're going to want to know geographically where those customers are, what industries they're in. There's a lot of data that they'll want to know, but coming back to the theme of today, is you probably should know that yourselves anyway. So if you're not already analysing your client list and looking at where business comes from, um, looking at who is managing that business, um, and then, you know, it's I don't know if you agree, Andrew, but you know the 80-20 rule is so is so common. You know, people say it's not, but it is. How many businesses do we talk to that you know they're making 80% of their profit from 20% of their customers, or you know, their problems are from one side? And so I think have a good look at that, analyse that customer mix. Um, it's something that a purchaser is going to want to do, but also I think it's going to pay dividends for you maximising the value of your business by having a good look at some of those things. Yeah, and also doing a customer profitability analysis. So you, when, when you're starting a business, you want to take on anything you can to, to help grow, but, but at some stage you're going to have to re review that and see if, you, if you're getting smaller margins from some customers, are they worth even keeping? Mm. You know, it might be worth eliminate the, eliminating the tail of your, of your customer base so that you can focus more on those key, key clients. And I think now's a good opportunity to do that. If your business is doing really well, now maybe is a time when you're so busy, why would you work on a customer that's either not profitable, the staff don't like dealing with the customer, it's you know, making them unhappy, and it's hard enough to attract and retain staff as it is at the moment without having that client that's ringing up and complaining why, they, why you haven't filled their vacancy, um, et cetera, et cetera. So thinking about that now is a good thing. Cameron, you're across a number of different industries and businesses. Uh, how do you rate recruitment companies versus other professional services businesses, for example, like accountants and lawyers? How do, how do recruitment companies stack up against uh, other industries? And in, in terms of looking at their customer bases? Yeah, well, like in that. profitability, in performance, in margins, in saleability. I think interesting to know. It's, there's some, there's some bits, and bits that you can take out of that. I think the recruitment industry at the moment as everyone would be aware, is just going gangbusters just off the back of you know the, the fact that the unemployment rate's so low and that it's hard to find people. Um, if, if the employment market is quite okay and there's lots of people around, people will go and advertise and seek and they'll do things themselves at the moment. That's not the case. You can't find anyone yourself, so you're going there. Um, in terms of profitability, I think you know some of those other professional service firms are doing quite well too but I think recruitment is probably a bit of a standout. So if you look at financials for some of these businesses, the money they've been making in the last two years is definitely far, in some cases it's double or triple what they were making um, before, in some cases it's you know, a slight increase, but it depends what industry you're in too. 
um, and what you're focusing on. So a generalist recruiter may be doing okay, but if you're a recruiter focusing in on an industry that's done really well in the pandemic, then you're going to be going gangbusters. So it, it just depends. In terms of then, and this is one that I talk to people about, in terms of, you know, I'm not interested in selling my business at the moment. I've still got another five or 10 years to go, so I don't need to worry about this. And the thing I challenge you on there is that you don't know where a potential buyer for your business may come one day. And, and for, for private businesses in Australia, you're not going to get the best value if you just turn around and say, okay, I'm going to advertise it online, or I'm going to get a business broker, or I'm going to you know, get my account to help me sell the business. And then they have to reach out to people that may be interested. You're probably not going to get your best price. Where you're going to get the best price is ideally someone contacting you and saying, I really like what you're doing. I've been watching what you've done for the last couple of years. The industry that you're specialising in and doing really well in is somewhere I think there's a lot of growth and there's a lot of opportunities and I want to talk to you about it. Um, and, and the only way to do that is to really get to know those people over time and get to understand you know, what they're doing. So going to conferences, going and meeting people in your industry I think is really important. Um, and, and maybe you know, having that network and having you know, contacts with international people and just being known. Um, and sometimes people say, well, I don't want people to know that I'm potentially going to sell my business. So I say to them, we'll just turn it on its head and say, I'm actually looking for, for acquiring other businesses. Doesn't mean you have to go and necessarily write a check, but you can use that pretense to have a discussion with people and say, I'm interested in acquiring other businesses. I just want to have a chat to you to see you know, whether you're interested in, in a little bit about your business. You'd be surprised. Most people like to talk about their business. They're, 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 they're proud of what they've achieved and they're proud of what they've done, so they, they're happy to talk about it. Um, I wouldn't underestimate potentially as part of your succession planning thinking about that management buyer option. Um, I, I think it can be a really good way to incentivise some of your key staff and potentially you're going to make money out of it because you're not going to sell 100% on day one and there's different ways of focusing that management buyer or that key sort of employee share plan but potentially, you know, we, we use the expression internally that if we could get more people acting like business owners in our business, we would be so much more successful. I think everyone would agree that at, at various times they get employees that look like they're just going through the motions, where a business owner that's incentivised and is really uh, motivated is going to achieve great results. Can you imagine if you had three or four people in your business that ended up with some sort of shareholding or equity and they're all motivated and working really hard like that? what results you're going to get in the short term are going to be potentially awesome and potentially you're helping that they've helped you get to where you are and hopefully you can help them you know succeed so it's something I wouldn't necessarily um, overlook or, or not consider um, as an option the last point there I was just going to say step into the you know potential buyer shoes and understand what you know why would someone want to buy your business so if you haven't asked yourself that question I probably would. Why would someone want to buy my business? What is it? What, what would they see the opportunities for? And why would they want that? Is it because of the industry that I'm in? Is it because of the maybe the segment in that industry that I'm targeting at the moment that's really in demand? And you can see economically that industry is going to be targeted massively in the future by other people. And so you can just see that growth there. Um, but understanding that, and you, if, if the answer to that question is, yeah, I'm not sure that anyone probably would want to buy this business, then maybe go back to, well, what can I do to increase my value? What things can I be doing to improve my business? Talk to your advisors that you've got in your business about what can you do to improve it and potentially get some external um, feedback. And, and I know Tony does that a lot with, with some of the advisory boards that he's part of. He challenges people's thinking. It's very easy to get into the day-to-day -day with what you're doing in the business and I think sometimes having that external person that can challenge your thinking and say to you, well, why are you doing what you're doing and what, you know, where do you want to go with this is very useful. This is just an interesting slide that I've got there about how um, someone might look at your business and, and particularly I think with the international buyers, they're potentially going to look at your existing business over here and then they're going to be looking at, well, what can I do to grow that, what's that growth potential? They're going to look at things like cross-selling opportunities with customers. So potentially you're providing a service into a particular industry that they're also in, but they're, they're doing different things, but it's similar customers. So potentially 
if you're in the mining industry and your customers are you know, BHP and Rio Tinto, and you've got a competitor that doesn't sell the same types of people in those industries, but it's complementary in that you've already got an in with those customers, or they don't currently sell to those customers, but maybe those customers could buy those services. So you've got to think, why would someone want to do it? Doing even things like eliminating a competitor, uh, potentially duplicating, you know, eliminating duplicated costs, that sort of stuff is something that, that someone could potentially look at doing uh, as a why, as a reason why. If you go back to my one of my first slides about the value of the business and the fact that an owner-managed business is maybe a two to three times multiple, and think about it, if you're a business that um, you know is potentially turning over 20 million. And um, sorry, let's start again. If you're a, a much bigger business and you've got say 100 people, and your multiple and your valuation, if you went to market, might be a four, five, six times. Why wouldn't you think about going out and buying maybe a smaller owner-managed business on maybe a two times multiple? If you can integrate that revenue at say it's five million dollars really well into your existing business, then you potentially have doubled or tripled your money. If you're paying a million dollars for that business at a two times multiple your multiple, that they sometimes refer to this as arbitrage, and your business is trading at a five or six times, and you can really nicely integrate that in, well then you know, you're going to triple your money and then coming back to my point earlier, that's a way potentially that you can bulk your size up over a five or six year period to walk towards maybe potentially an exit down the track. I'll quickly, I think we've got about another ten minutes, something like that, Tony. So, I'll quickly just look at business structuring. You know, you should think about, is, is my structure right? Am I running my business through maybe a partnership or a unit trust? Is that going to be the right structure for a buyer? Is, is, a, is a purchaser going to want to maybe buy me if, if I'm in a company rather than in a sole trader or, or that sort of thing? So have a look at your business structure because that's probably not something you can do five minutes before a sale. It might be something you need to do in advance. Um, a lot of deals in terms of structuring, so a lot of professional service businesses and recruitment's no different. They A purchaser doesn't want to give you a bank check, I refer to it, for the whole purchase price on day one and then walk away. They're concerned that potentially key staff might leave. They're, they're concerned that potentially you as the owner, if you've got to stay on for a couple of years, might take your eye off the wall. And so what they refer to is maybe an earn out. And so they might give you some money up front. Sometimes that's as low as 50%, sometimes it's a bit higher and then potentially you get the rest of the money assuming things happen. So some of those earnouts are not really prescriptive in terms of that you have to massively hit numbers, but what some purchasers are concerned about is that they don't want to pay a lot of money and see the business fall off a cliff the next day. So as long as you meet certain things, then you'll get those certain payments. So it's, it's useful to understand those sorts of things. And then, you know, if you, if you are interested in doing something, talk to your advisors about what these small business CGT concessions might look like. They're a really good way of taking money out from the sale, paying you know, a lower rate of tax, and potentially, ideally, even um, putting some of that into superannuation, which is going to help for your retirement. So that's, unless there's any questions on the, the sort of maximising the value of your business, I'm then going to move on to some, quickly, some end of financial year tips, seeing as we're approaching 30 June. So if you've got any questions, happy to take them now or at the end, just in terms of the business value stuff. In terms of year-end tax planning, as I said before, we're, we're fast approaching 30 June. Um, you know, we've just had a change of government, so potentially what tends to happen when there's a change of government tends to be, I think I, think I heard last night that the new Prime Minister had already changed the, the three flags that were behind when they make a press conference. He's already sacked the head of the public service. You know, the, New governments like to do things, they like to do changes, they like to change things. And unfortunately for the tax system, they tend to like to also fiddle around with the taxes. So we're probably expecting that when there's a mini budget in September, that's what they've sort of highlighted at Labor 1, the election, they're probably going to come in and tinker with some things. So uh, we'll, we'll wait and see what they, what they do. All we know is that they're probably going to change some things. First thing I'd start by doing now, if you haven't already done it, is get some interim accounts up to date. So have a look and see what your accounts to the end of April or in a couple of weeks to the end of May look like and go through and start cleaning things up, start asking questions if the stuff that you need to have done and you need to pay things, for example, or you need to 
you know, talk to someone about getting an invoice, do those sorts of things now rather than waiting until July or August when potentially it's a bit late or it's harder to do things. Um, as we approach 30 June, I can guarantee there will be a lot more commercials on TV around this immediate write-off for assets. So you might be aware when we're in the midst of the COVID pandemic, the government basically said there's no, now no limit until, 2000, until June 23. You can buy assets and you can immediately write them off. So previously you might have to write off an asset over five or six years at the moment and there's no limit on that value, you can write them off. So if you're in an industry that maybe is in manufacturing, you might want to buy a machine, then that might be really useful to you. But still for recruitment, potentially there's things like there's cars, there's potentially office equipment, there's furniture, uh, computers, IT, that sort of stuff. There's potentially things that you might want to consider buying uh, before 30 June and then getting a tax benefit this year. Was there the 130% one on technology? Is that still around? So that was a coalition policy if they were to get re-elected. So I think we can assume now that that's not going to happen. Oh, so that's a, so that, so the cloud based that those platforms? Yeah, 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 technology related. Yeah. So that was in the yeah. budget. Yeah. When was that? When was the budget this year, March or, ah. or whatever? That was an announcement in that federal budget yeah. by the coalition who at that point were in power and said if they got re elected, these are the things that they would do and they weren't going to be effective until at least 1 July. So um, now that they've not been re elected, I can pretty much imagine that probably won't see the light of day. But going back to my comment that they tend to like to have their own way of doing things and they don't yeah. want to copy you know, the, the opposition policy because that shows that potentially that was a good policy. Which, so. Think about things like employee commission and bonuses. So if you had a really good financial year, how do you, do you want to reward your staff a little bit better? And if you do, maybe you know, do something before 30 June because if you do, you might better get a tax deduction for that or at least um, confirm or lock in what that number might be. So even if you pay it in July, as long as you've got a written resolution internally in the business, just in your own paperwork, you can potentially claim that as a deduction um, in this, this current financial year and help reduce your tax. Because you, we, we work on the basis that you don't know what the future looks like, so why leave a tax deduction for next year that you can get this year? Consider you know, salary sacrificing super for yourself if you haven't already done so up to the limits. Um, maybe consider deferring some dividends into next year if you can just to, to defer that um, top up tax that you have to pay personally when you're paying a dividend. The last one I've got there, if you've got a family trust you may have heard of this but back in February the ATO uh, introduced um, sort of updated guidance around distributing uh, monies from families, family trust to adult children and the fact that they're going to be looking at those things a lot more closely so if you've got a family trust and you're distributing to, to maybe some of your kids that are sort of 18 to 21 and you're getting a good tax benefit out of it at the moment, or maybe you're distributing to other family members, I, would, um, I won't go into any detail. I'd recommend just talking to your advisors and sort of seeing what, what that might look like. Um, as we're finishing off, this is just a, so at William Buck, a, a service that we offer, uh, normally complimentary is what we refer to as a William Buck hour. So it's a bit of a health check that we're able to go into businesses. And so we'll go into a recruitment business, for example, talk to them about what they're doing, and then come back to them with a report, which is a bit of a traffic light report, giving them some suggestions on things that they could be doing better. So it's a way we find to get to know people better, get to know businesses before we maybe start working with them. Um, and I'm happy to offer it to, to anyone that's here today. If you want to contact me, I've got some business cards, and we're happy to, do one, to set that up. Um, as I said, it's complimentary. I've every single one we've done, we've always had good feedback that people have found it was really useful to sit down for an hour or so, talk about their business and just have an external person give them some guidance or just some suggestions and feedback on some of the things that they're doing. So it's not just purely financial based. A lot of the questions are, are around your strategy and some of them are even around personally, what are you doing? Do you have a personal financial plan? Um, it, you know, how are you planning for retirement? Do you have superannuation? There's some really interesting things there. So happy to chat to anyone afterwards on that. Um, that's just our contact details for the, the three of us from um, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane if you want to make contact. We've also got some um, business cards if people want to talk. And that's basically the end of the presentation. Thanks everyone. It's been great to, to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you all, you all
tips on how to maximize the value of your group business. Any quick questions while Cameron's still here? Any uh, pre-gen 30 tax advice that you can get straight from the horse's mouth if you like? Really good presentation. Thank you, Cameron. Now, questions, things that you're thinking about. You're maximizing super. I notice a lot of owners don't maximize super in there. Yeah, it's a, it's a really it's a really tax effective way to save for your retirement, and you know there's never it's never too early to start. You've just got to work a plan that works for you best, and just um, start somewhere. That's what I always say. It adds up, doesn't it? it? Does. Yeah. Yeah. No, very good. Well, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, really well prepared, and um, we're going to send a copy of the presentation yep. out to where everyone around Australia that you know, normally attends as well. So thanks for that. Um, thanks for all your efforts. Thanks, Andrew. And um, thank you all very much for coming. A special thanks.